people in the part of the world you are in. We are broadcasting again with our lunchtime writing game. Uh, my name is Sam Blake. I'm a crime author and I run writing.ie. Um, and in two seconds, I'm going to be introducing you to literary agent Simon Truin. Um, the writing game is something we started off during lockdown um, and it's a whole series of interviews with the most amazing authors. Um, do look back at the videos that we've done already. Um, at the very, very start of lockdown, Simon and I had some big chats about publishing and how to get published. So if that's something that you're interested in, then um, do absolutely look back at those videos. They're packed full of information. Now, as well as broadcasting to Facebook, we are broadcasting to YouTube. Uh, which we hope is working. I'm not allowed to say that we had any technical difficulties today. I've been strictly banned. I'm going to bring Simon and I'm going to bring our fantastic first guest for this season, Patience um, Agabalbi, into the uh, into your room now. Um, so bear with me just one second. Now, oh, both of you came together. Perfect there timing. Look at that, brilliant. Now then, let me just get rid of this little thing here. There we go. Now, Simon Truen and Patience, I will leave you to it. I should disappear for one second. Um, if I can work You're going to disappear? Over. I'm going to try, yeah. This is like some game show, isn't it? Patience, good morning. How are you? Hello, Simon. Thank you. Um, hello. I'm, I'm, well, I'm well. This is surreal. <laughs> it is, isn't it? But it's, it's good to see that we both, we're both sitting in rooms with books behind us, and that's... Uh, that's a, that's a good thing. Uh, we, when we moved into this house, it, it seemed impossible we'd ever fill it with books. But we, I feel like we live in a library now, and I think it's uh, it's good to be surrounded. Is your is your home full of books in in all sorts of places? Yeah, yeah, more more books than bricks. I mean, we just we, one of the biggest things we did was just order a fitted bookshelf in this main room where I work. So, but for months we had like had piles of boxes, and it was driving me crazy. But yeah, there, there are books on all over even in the hall <laughs> even going up the stairs his books which yeah. is great actually i love i love the physicality of books you know i sort of find they're like my friends i need to be surrounded by them to feel human yeah i mean i think yeah i sometimes feel if we took the walls down from our house the house would still exist because it would just be as you say more books than bricks um i, I mean it's it's interesting i think during during lockdown which is impossible you know, a lot of people have been unable to go to bookshops and have been reading ebooks, but they've also been rediscovering old books that they've had and maybe haven't got around to reading. And I think that that's that's one of the joys for me is just sort of finally getting round to reading. And have you, have you found that have you found that reading has been something that has helped sustain you during this period? Um, well, yeah, well, I had the, um, the, the challenge of um, writing book two during lockdown mm. because um, yeah. book, book one came out in, in April, uh, April yeah. 2nd was the publication date, but book two had to be in the end of June. And, um, and I'll be honest, um, in, by, by 2nd of April, I'd written one of 24 chapters of the book. So, um, <laughs> but I had done a lot of planning. I'd done all the planning and everything. I just started writing it in March. And then the world had gone mad and um, it had been very hard to focus. And then April was crazy um, because I became unwell myself. But um, but I basically wrote the book yeah. in mo mostly in May, actually. So most wow. it wasn't so much reading as writing as just having to knuckle down and meet that deadline. Yeah. Good. Well, we're going to we're going to come we're going to come back. We're going to circle back to talking about The Infinite and, and the upcoming sequel. But I, I want to sort of go back a little bit earlier on to your to your kind of journey at, to becoming a writer and I just wanted to know uh, when you were at school for instance did you have did you have a kind of influential teacher that showed you about the, the love of books and and reading and writing was that was there someone in your life then yeah I had a brilliant English teacher called Mr Toy um, who a um, great name yeah Mr. Toy. yeah Mm. Yeah, he was. He was just. He was just really. He was just inspirational. His love of literature really shone through. He was quite a character, and um, so I had him for both O level and A level. And um, it, yeah, he was just really helpful. You know, he was supportive when I I went for for the Oxbridge um, English uh, exam, and you know, he was really supportive with that too. I mean, it wasn't. We weren't the kind of school that normally did that, but. He was just, he was fantastic. And so I just read beyond the curriculum, you know, so if I was doing Hardy, I'd just read more Hardy, <laughs> you know, more Shakespeare, yeah. more Milton, more whatever. Um, so, yeah, but he wasn't, he didn't really know about my writing so much because I was writing as a kid. 
And um, but he got mm. me into Chaucer, and he got me into. So I wrote my general product of the Colwyn Bay Tales. I was living in North Wales, so I did that. And um, but he never. Wow. I don't think he ever actually saw the manuscript. I think he sort of knew I wrote, but I never showed him the writing. But he knew I was into the reading and the literature and the and discussion. Did, and did he? Did he live long and oh, is he still alive? Has he seen you grow into a published author? Yes, yes, he has. Um, when um, when Telling Tales, which is my Chaucer remix, when that came out in 2014, yeah. in 2015, I think it was, I, I did an event in um, in North Wales, in, in Conway, and, um, and and he managed to attend, and it was fantastic. Oh, I, I literally hadn't seen him since school days, so there's you know, a massive, massive gap um, between us. But I had been in touch in, in the interim. I did something for the TES about my favourite teacher, and he featured in that. So I had been in touch with him. And, and unfortunately, he passed away very recently this year. Right. So, um, but I do feel that, yeah, he was able to sort of see the fruit of his labours in in, yeah, in mean, my in my success, certainly with telling tales. I mean, I think being a teacher, there is this sort of conveyor belt of pupils that go through, but it must be, it must be really, you know, life enhancing if you're a teacher to see people going on and taking that baton on running with it. Um, so yeah, you talked about you you went off went off to study and what was there a moment when you began to think of yourself as a as a writer or indeed as something as someone who could make writing a, a life yeah I think um after university I I wrote I wrote more in a way it was a react a bit of a reaction I did a very traditional sort of Oxford English degree which was great yeah. on lots mm. of levels but I I kind of felt that my there was a lack of representation let's 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 go there there was a real yeah, you know yeah. surprise yeah. surprise um weren't many black authors on the uh on the curriculum however one of my tutors was really really into into african literature and he was telling me to read chinua chebe's boli soyinka you know africa like west yeah. african and nigerian writers in particular which i did so that was sort of opened a real door in my head and um so yeah when i when i left university um, I st started reading more widely and attending poetry readings as well and meeting meeting other you know black writers and writers of color as well as white writers working class writers all a whole man you know range of voices um, more literary events more performance poetry yeah. events just the whole the whole works really um, so that all that fed my stuff but I have to be honest it wasn't until I was published by Feminist Review in 1988 where they published two of my poems that I really felt like a proper writer I think there's still that sort of that sense of until you're published you're not really a real writer which of course isn't true you know you can you can sort of I don't know write plays that are performed and and you know critically yeah. acclaimed which which haven't yet you know may been published and of course you are a writer there's no question about it and yet there was something about being published maybe it's a poetry thing in particular I don't know because that's yeah, what I started I mean, out as was a poet because in the in the poetry world I mean my my feeling is that you know, it is all about building up those sort of layers of being published, isn't it? Until until you're kind of awarded the honour of having a collection coming out. It's almost something that is conferred upon you by the by the community, isn't it? Rather than, you know, I think if you're a, a writer of fiction, you, you kind of go out and seek a publisher, whereas it, it almost feels like the other way around. I mean, do you... Um, I would agree with that. <laughs> I would certainly agree with that that fact that you yeah, that you you have to yeah, publish publish individual poems or little snatches of poems in in smaller magazines yeah. and build a, and slowly build a reputation. It's much more organic in that sense. You don't suddenly yes. have this big splash because any poet being published has sort of been around for a while and people probably know who they are whereas I think yeah. with a novel you can sort of seem to come out from nowhere. I don't know. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm learning all this. This is all new. You know, I'm a sort mm. of a, as a debut novelist. I'm not really sure how it works with novels, but certainly yeah, with nice poetry, to, that's that's it's the nice right to be a passage. Deb debut novelist, isn't it? After so many years of uh, being published in different forms, and I was going to—that's something I was kind of reading, reading various interviews with you and various things, and, and obviously. On one level, you know, people define you as a poet, and then people say you're a performance poet or you're a, you know, a collector of stories. And I think that that to me is quite interesting because do you think now you're going to define yourself as a poet who also writes fiction, or are you 
are you a writer who just finds the most appropriate form to tell a story in? And I, you know, that, that, that to me is a kind of pivotal moment, I think. I think at the moment, I, I still feel very much like a, a poet who happens to have written two novels. Um, yeah. But of course, only one has been published yeah. um, so far. Um, the other one will hopefully come out next year. That is the plan. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I think I think it's partly to do with the way I create, because I create very much, it's very much springing off a of single words. It's very much mining the wordplay rather than maybe thinking about character and plot. Um, although having said that, I did I did come up with a character. So maybe maybe to some degree I do I do think like a novelist. It, it it's been interesting because I started off I've always liked monologues. I've always been interested in voice. And um mm. so you know throughout my four collections there are monologues, but it wasn't till telling tales, which of course are Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, which of course are stories, but I wrote them as poems, I started to sort of take on the idea of the character and the voice. And sort of took it to another level. So I think um, that clearly, I think I think telling tales was a great way to segue into writing, um, you know, longer longer fiction yeah. for me. But it started off. I always start very micro. Maybe that's the poet poet in me. It starts very very small and kind of spreads out from something very tiny. Whereas I I understand some novelists, for example, have a sense of a world, a sort of bigger sense of focusing in. Whereas I'm the opposite. I kind of seem to have zoomed right in. On a few key things and then built from them yeah i mean i'm going to come back to your process and structure because i think that's um you know a lot of people watching and listening to this are sort of struggling with that whole notion of world building which i think is um as you say some people start with the google earth of seeing the whole world and then zooming in and some people see a tiny little thing and then zoom out but we'll, we'll maybe we'll we'll come back to that in in a in a little while but um you mentioned telling tales and you mentioned um, reading Chaucer at school. And I think I think for a lot of people, Chaucer is, it's like reading a foreign language until you hear it read out loud. But on the paper, on the, on the paper, it's really difficult to understand. Did, did you find that at the beginning? I think, again, I was very lucky. Mr. Toy was the one who just, he just read it out so beautifully. But of course, we yeah. were... You know, when it was introduced, we were, we were reading on the page while simultaneously hearing it. Right. So we had the sort of the oral hour experience and um, mm. which was quite powerful. So and I think it really helped. I mean, I was also studying when well, I'd, I'd done French and German O level, showing my age here, the previous era of the, you know, GCSE equivalent. So um, I, I sort of had an understanding of I could see the French and the, the Germanic influences kind of mm. coming together. In, in Chaucer's Middle English and, and um, found that quite exciting. I um, quite liked the difficulty, but bear in mind, I was living in North Wales. So I was hearing Welsh every day, you know, in shops or on the street as well as English. Um, yeah, so it, even though I couldn't really speak very much Welsh, I was learning it in school and I was fascinated with language. I've always loved the sound of languages. When I, was, when I got into Shakespeare, I watched mm. an Othello in Russian <laughs> of course, there were subtitles, but again, it was just something about the sound was, was really drew me in. So I've always been somebody who's been fascinated with sounds and languages. Even though I'm no linguist, I'm not particularly good at speaking other languages, but I'm absolutely fascinated with how language works. Yeah, I mean, that that notion of, um, I mean, yeah, Can Canterbury Tales, it's, it is about, or it's about sort of, it is about oral history in a way. It's a, it's a book about storytelling, isn't it? And um, and I just sort of wonder when you came to when you came to telling tales, which was uh, your own interpretation of of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. For those people who haven't read it, did you did you feel kind of burdened by by the um, the reputation of Chaucer in terms of what you were trying to do? Because in a way, Absolutely. it's an incredibly yeah. arrogant idea, isn't it, to do it? But it's fantastic, and it and it turned out so well, didn't it? But, you know. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, but I'm one of these people, I have these, I have ideas and um, and I, you know, pride myself that some of them thankfully are quite good ones. And I'm very, very enthusiastic and very confident initially. And, you know, I, so I got Arts Council funding and I was saying, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And then I got the funding and actually was like rabbit caught in the headlights. I'm like, oh my God, what have I taken on? Am I actually, mm. can I actually do this? Do I have the skills? Do I have the confidence? 
So um, thankfully, um, you know, the, the poetry community are particularly supportive in that way. I was lucky to know Jane Draycott, who'd done, um, she'd done a version of um, the medieval dream poem, Pearl. And, um, and she just said to me, she said, look, she said, you know, just, just, just position yourself in these different ways around the text. Are you, are you walking in Chaucer's footsteps? Are you behind him? Or are you in front of him? Do you see yourself as sort of this modern pioneer? Or are you walking beside him? Are you hand in hand with him? You know, or are you actually like, like literally in his body inhabiting him? And I suddenly thought, oh, actually, there's all these different ways I can interpret this. I don't have to do any one way. And it's really important I have fun with it because one of the things I love about Chaucer is there's, there's, a, there's a twinkle in his eye a lot of the time. You know, there's a lot of fun, um, both in the actual overt humour and the Chaucerian irony, but also just in some of his wordplay, you know, that you could tell he was having fun with the writing. And, um, right. and I felt I've got to have fun with this. The only way I can do this is to have fun. So, um, you know, every time I sat at my computer, I had to remind myself to not be overawed and that actually Chaucer would want me to have fun. And it was ridiculous sort of being being frozen about it. I just had to just just do one poem at, poem at a time and just sort of, you know, gradually tick them off and, you know, just start enjoying it. And after three or four poems, the, the first three or four the first one was a nightmare. It was terrible. I was too uptight and took three months <laughs> of one poem and it was a nightmare. But um, wow. but thankfully I rewrote it. It worked. I moved on and uh, started to have fun. And then, then so it, you, yeah, it you, was manageable you, and fun. You talked about the oral and the aural earlier on. Did you, did you read the poem out? Did you read the poem out to yourself as you were writing it? Did you, did you find that a useful technique? Yeah, the, yeah, there were certain, cer certainly, I mean, there were certain um, p stories I, I knew quite well, tales I knew well, like the Pardoner's Tale, for example, which has this medieval uh, Latin refrain, radix malorum est cupiditas, and it's just, you know, listening to, hearing the Latin and the, the Anglo-Saxon, and, you know, in, in that he also plays around with French, you know, words of French origin and so on, so it, it just... Yeah, it was just, yeah, actually feeling the words on my tongue, you know, actually mouthing the words and, and of course, hearing them. So it was, you know, both oral, aural, and, of course, then the visual as well of, again, revisiting them on the page. It was all those things coming together really, really kind of brought it back to life. And I listened to other people as well, people online reading, you know, bought some bought some more CDs, you know, DVDs, whatever. I tried to remember even what, what was around at the time, but but certainly did a lot online, yeah. a lot of research online. And, um, yeah, I was, was able to engage with it on all, all kinds of levels. Um, so it's, it's great. I mean, um, there's one of our... One of our followers here, Maxi Maxi, is saying your fun transfers to the readers, and that's a that's a nice thing to think of, isn't it? That you're 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 lighting a little spark on the page, and it's sort of fizzing all the way through to uh, to the other end. You, you talked about uh, engaging and and performance and things, and just going back onto the poetry side and the performance poet side, which I know is, um, you know, that's a kind of phrase of the last sort of 10 15 years isn't it this whole notion of being a performance poet um do you, do you think that need to engage in person with your readers in that case an audience does that may does that mean you write slightly different kinds of poetry do you think are you are you kind of imagining what it how it might work in a room rather than just on the page um it's an interesting issue i mean i i i don't i the term performance poetry it's kind yeah. of it's it's complex i do i do embrace it on some levels um yeah i don't feel i've, I've been a performance poet the past few years so yeah. it feels a little outdated for me but um but yes yeah, certainly i think i think i've always been interested in both i've always been interested in in the words on the page and you know, being as good as possible in the editing process as well as the yeah. sound of the words um i've always seen there's always been a three dimensionality even to the words on the page but um, as as for imagining an audience, um, unless I'm actually when I've been creating raps, you know, something that's specifically overtly designed to be performed out loud, then yeah. most of the time, not really. I just sort of create stuff. But because I create in such a sound based way, then a lot of it does translate. And because I I'm a writer who you know, believes in being accessible, I suppose. I don't try to dumb it down necessarily. I mean, I have readers yeah. who read it and say, actually, patients, I don't understand what's going on here at all. So it's more clarification than um, 
than sort of the, the sort of decomplicating the work. I like the idea of it working on, on multiple levels. Um, but yeah, because I'm that kind of poet as well, it has lent itself well to to live performance. And and I was lucky enough in the past, I, I, I used to have an incredibly good memory for uh, for learning my work. But maybe that part of it was because the process of learning it was of, of, of composing it was to actually hear it out loud in my head. I often didn't mouth the words out loud. I'd just hear them out loud in my head, hear voices, in fact. So um, that, yeah, that's definitely part of my creative process. But no, I don't, I wouldn't say I generally did have a, a particular audience in mind, apart from myself. But in a way, you when you got to do, when you got to write Telling Tales, it was kind of, in a way, it was the book you were always maybe even subconsciously heading towards writing at some point, because it kind of, brought together so many things that you've talked about this whole notion of you know because I mean if Chaucer was alive today would he be a performance poet I suppose is the question because in a way he was he was all about telling tales wasn't he and he would have yeah. you know, recognized what you were trying to do there absolutely I mean it was very you know Chaucer of course was very literary and very educated and it was about performing at court but actually you know this basically the medieval era it was most people were illiterate um it was an yeah. what, what I find interesting interesting about Chaucer was um, at the end of the Canterbury Tales he talks about he, he kind of addresses all the people who wish to hearkner this little book and also reader as in listen and read and and that dual that duality keeps reappearing throughout the text and so yes it was it was a hairs on the back of the neck moment where I thought wow that's my poetics this is it so yes I, I totally felt that Chaucer you know re-mixing re Chaucer Yes, I was sort of made to do that. But in a sense, I think I also had that sense after doing that. I didn't really know, know what to do next with my with my poetry. It was like, oh, my God, I've sort of written this book and um, I have got other ideas for poems and I have written a few poems since. But actually, I did. I did feel that I'd sort of reached a weird kind of crossroads after telling tales. And um, and suddenly the idea of writing a novel became more of a reality. It was something I thought about for many years, but I'd always pushed it to the behind. The poetry was always my my first love, but um, but yes, I think I think telling tales was was transitional for me. I didn't realise at the time, but it was only after writing it that I thought mm. something's happened here. That that's really exciting. And in, um, just quickly, because I I really want to do a deep dive now into into the fiction. But you uh, you you got involved in another kind of storytelling, which was listening to people's testimony about some very you know challenging things in their lives and you got involved in the refugee tales maybe just tell us a little bit about that process because you're there's a there's a different kind of responsibility towards the text there than there was with Chaucer wasn't there because the people are in front of you I'm guessing absolutely I mean the, the process for for refugee tales was um each writer was paired up with with a refugee asylum seeker or um and um, and we basically re recorded their story. We sort of interviewed them and re the story was recorded. So we met them in person. And mm. then our duty was as much as possible to to retell their story. So it was a collaboration. Um, we all felt a duty to use as many of their words as possible. However, we were writers. So we also had the responsibility to craft too. So it was this dual mega responsibility, especially as at the time, you know, the newspapers, the press was presenting a very different story around refugees and asylum seekers, which is very negative and very de de dehumanizing. So it was very important yeah. for us to put the humanity back in and to put the language back into it, to use their own language, but to also use the language as practiced writers to, to reach a broader audience. And um, which and, and read the refugee tales. Um, the whole the whole um, movement has been very successful. The bit of the book the book has sold out, and there have been three uh, two more anthologies since then. Um, there's a walk, there's an annual walk every year, which has got got larger and larger. People are starting to listen. The MPs have become involved to try to stop put a put a stop to indefinite um, detention in the UK. So that all sorts of things have come from. Um, from a work of literature, really. I mean, obviously, it's also modelled on um, the Canterbury Tales, the idea of walking, of being in fellowship. You know, the word fellowship is yeah. actually used in Chaucer and um, that, that right. sense of community and empathy um, that goes with that. So, yeah, it's been, it's been a, 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 a fantastic and heart 
warming project to to be involved in. So do you almost see you see yourself almost as a a translator in that situation, somebody who's listening to words and translating them into a different medium? I mean, what's the what's no, the process? I, I wouldn't use the word a translator. Um, it's it's a hard one. I mean, I've often even even um, just write writing normal poems. Sometimes you almost feel like you're 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 the vessel for for, yes, for yeah, some that's something that's kind of the zeitgeist, yeah. something that's in the ether that you, somehow it's gone through you, and it's your duty to sort of mm. let it out in the best way possible. And I mean, in 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 that sense, no, it didn't it it, it didn't feel. I mean, a lot of in, in in the refugees' tale, a lot of the phrases are are the, the the refugees own phrases that i've yeah. kind of incorporated into the work so yeah it's it's and again we're back to that issue of voice um when when she yeah. heard my poem the live for the first time she said it's me and i i thought yeah that validates the whole project that that you know that i have yeah. managed to somehow use as much of her own testimony as I can. At the same time, I created a corona, which is a, a, a sonnet sequence. So I, you know, obviously I, I added the rhymes in and sort of, you yeah. know, structured it and so on. So, because a lot of writing, a lot of the craft is for me is about structure. You know, it's about okay. the sort of, you know, words in the best order or the best words in the best order, depending on whether you're talking about poetry or prose to, to quote Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Yeah. So do you, so you've, uh... The, the S word has reared its head now, structure. And I think that's something that I know a lot of people um, struggle with. Now, you you talked about, um, you talked about the Chaucer being a kind of bridge from your poetry to you thinking you could write a novel. Now, I know, um, I know in your kind of other life, you, you train, you know, you're, you're an athlete and, you know, you like to, do, do you see do you see a kind of novel as a marathon and a poem as a sprint or is that is that simplifying to things too much i mean just interested in why you felt the idea of writing a novel was something that you had to kind of limber up for <laughs> yeah i'm a, i'm a very i'm a bad athlete <laughs> but i love it i absolutely love it uh, there's nothing like sprinting um yeah. yeah it's an interesting issue i i at first you see a lot of people say that poetry is more akin to the short story so I actually tried to write some right. short stories as sort of part of my um, my initiation into prose, and and they were fine. But I don't know. It's, it's I think that the issue is it depends on the idea, doesn't it? The idea I had was too big for a short story, so I had mm. to I really had to go for the novel. Um, and interestingly, in, in my but in my running, I like I do like the short and the long. So I like sprinting. You know, 100 and 200 meters. I mean, really, 200 meters is a bit far for me. Yeah, um, yeah, I know. But then I like park runs, which which are 5k. Now, okay, so marathon runners will laugh at me because that is nothing to a marathon runner. But for me, that's a long way. Um, anything in between is quite difficult. So I quite like I like the idea of getting into a zone. And I think when you're writing longer fiction, you sort of get into a zone, and I like that a lot. I really love that. Um, so. Um, so I, I just found that after the short stories, I thought I'm messing around here. I just need to get on with it. You know, I love the short story, by the way, as a form. I'm not I'm not dismissing it in any way at no. all. I absolutely adore short stories. But but for me and for the for the idea I had, it had to be a novel. And so I um I did ask my novelist friends, help. I want to write a novel. What 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 do you recommend? And one of them, Kate Clancy, who's written in every form imaginable, yeah. said, get a screenwriting book. That will help you with structure. Ah, okay. so um, so I did. I got more than I got about three different screenwriting books, and um, and I used a storyboard. Um, so um, yes, I just found it, and I liked I liked the um, the fun part of that, the sort of playing. So I literally bought a physical board, um, like you know, a, a big thing. It's not even virtual; it's a real thing, like a big old notice board. Thing. And I, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, like a big notice board sort of thing that you have. On yeah. The wall. Yeah. Yeah. And I and I put the, and I had all these different coloured cards. So I, I love really? stationery. I'm a stationery freak. So I enjoy buying ah. all the different coloured cards. And, you know, yellow is like a peril. Yellow star is a peril point. And just kind of plotting and playing around on with the board, I just found incredibly helpful. Just being able to see the whole plot in front of my eyes. 
Um, that was, I don't think I could have written the novel without that, to be honest. But bear in mind, when I write poetry, I like writing with forms. So I like sonnets and sestinas and villanelles um, and making my own forms. I like, I love the structure. I find that there's a sort of aesthetic joy and a liberation in having a structure and not having to worry about the structure because you've sort of got something and then working within that, within the constraints is, is conversely liberating. So, so with the same, the same way with the novel, having somehow having the, the structure was just really, really helped. And so before I started writing, I had like, um, I had the sense that it's going to be 24 chapters. Um, and, um, you know, in each book, because it, because all, yeah, we haven't got, got there yet, have we? But, um, but I'm playing with the 24 hour clock. There's a lot of time references. So, yeah. um, so I started that, that was very helpful. And, um, and, and, and yeah, just, um, and also having um, a subject, um, each, uh, what do you call them? Title headings. <laughs> so I, I knew, yeah. I knew, I knew the um, each chapter heading. You know, I had a kind of a, a working title for each chapter heading as well, which which was often based on wordplay of some kind. So, um, in a sense, right. I, I I I broke down the sort of massive structure of a novel into manageable chunks. So I was yeah. still thinking like a poet in that sense. Yeah, I mean that's uh, that's this is absolutely fascinating, and um, you know I haven't heard you talk like this before about the the structure. And it's interesting that 24, because I think um, most films, I think, break down to sort of 22 or 24 scenes, if you actually break them down and look at the different chapters. So there's there's quite clearly something, there's something embedded deeply within us about the 24-hour clock and how that works for a story. But maybe what we should do is, uh, I'm now going to hold up the book here. Uh, and obviously, this, this is a book that has, has a high concept. It has um, it has a distinct journey that your character is going to go on, and maybe maybe you could just for those who haven't read it, and for those who haven't read it, go to your local independent bookstore or Amazon, buy it immediately, uh, read it now, and there's another one out next year. But maybe tell us, introduce us, excuse me, to your central character and uh, what makes her so special. Yeah, my central character is called L, spelled E double L E, which is which is significant because yep. it's a palindrome. And those of you who are into tenet will understand all about palindromes and time going backwards and mm. forwards and so on. So, so yep. the wordplay was very helpful. She's um, she's a leapling, which means she was born on the 29th of February. Leapling is actually a word. I didn't make up the word leapling. It just it already existed in the English language, but. Um, but yes, yeah, she, she's a leapling and she has the ability to leap through time. Um, not all leaplings have this, very, a very small percentage of them have it. Um, she's, um, she's of Nigerian heritage, like me, and she's an athlete, like me, and um, she likes pepper soup, like me too. Um, but, um, <laughs> but she's also autistic, and I'm, I'm not autistic, although I would call myself, um, what, how would I define myself? A, a listic. I, would, I don't define as neurotypical either. In fact, I've used the term neurocreative. My older son is autistic. I, I know a lot of autistic people. It was quite important for me to, um, to represent an autistic voice and especially a black autistic voice and a black autistic girl voice. So there's all those things in. There's all these sort of different layers to her core personality. Um, and, uh, but it's an, an adventure story where she goes on a school trip to 2048 um, and um, she has to solve a crime because leaplings are disappearing in time. And she and her best friend, Big Ben, are sort of on this quest to, to find out what's going on and to save the missing leaplings. So um, with that, you had a you had a storyboard before you wrote the first chapter. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it all the concept really came from the word leap, <laughs> to be honest. Um, yeah. I mean, it was it was following it was following all my obsessions. So you know, I've got the uh, obviously I've got the the word obsession because let's face it, all writers have that the, the word obsession. But in particular, I like palindromes yeah. a lot. So having the the e double l e thing going, and then this sense of then I'm already sort of sub subliminally thinking, oh, things going backwards and forwards, and then suddenly there's this idea of um, if Elle's an athlete, she's probably going to be into athletics, so she'll like the Olympics. And then I thought, well, what's my favourite Olympics? My favourite Olympics is the 1968 Olympics where Bob Beeman did his amazing long jump leap um, of eight metres 90. So that had to go in. So um, Elle shares a lot of my obsessions. It was the easiest way for me to write was to, to really sort of deep, del deep, I don't know, delve deep into my own obsessions, but through the voice of, of a much younger character who's quite different in other ways to myself. Um, and, um, and of course, 
as the, the Olympics, Summer Olympics always happen in a leap year. So you've got the sort of double leap thing going. And I thought, oh, oh right, here we go. So. You know, we've got the, the actual leapers in the long jump and we've got the leap year thing going. And then I started thinking about leaping through time. And this is great quote from um, Lynn Davis, who, who uh, this um, is Welsh long jump. He won the, um, the long jump title in 1964, the, the Olympics before. And he said when Bob Beamer did his jump, he said that he'd... Um, that almost like he'd, he'd leapt almost like 50 years in history. They, I'm not quoting it exactly, but there was that sense that mm. he, it was so good that it was sort of that he'd done, he'd done, he'd almost time traveled in the way that he'd, you know, blown everyone off the planet. And I like that idea too. So it's a little compliment of all these things coming together. And of course, uh, because of coronavirus, there's been no Olympics this year. So we're suddenly going to be out of kilter, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, which no. really annoys me. <laughs> you right, that, that, you know? that sense of every four years. So that yeah, that part of that part of my personality is deeply disturbed by the um the disruption of it not happening. And twenty twenty, isn't that just such a lovely year? I mean, you know, in terms of the the the, the sound play of twenty twenty, it's just I just love it. So <laughs> so um yeah, it did it did sort of throw me on that level. Oh clearly, you know, as a as a as the reality of 2020 has been, it's been an incredibly challenging year for for many many people and um, unprecedented. So yeah, yeah, has. we've had to we've had to rethink a lot around it, and it's been strained because I've been setting the next book in 2021, and of course we don't know what the reality will be in 2021. No. But I've just had to kind of just again delve back into Elle's world and 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 create something fictional. Yeah, I think I think the whole notion of writing a contemporary novel has been thrown on its head by this year because, you know, are writers going to have to set all contemporary novels in 2019? You know, or is it because, you know, we are, you know, it's like any novel set in the 1950s was inevitably looking at the effects of the Second World War on the general population. So I think it's going to be a, uh, and seeing that through the eyes of your central character, I think is a, is an interesting one indeed. But I was going to ask you, I mean, normally you go into schools, don't you? And you do events yeah. and I should think kids absolutely love you because you come in and you're not what they expect a poet to be. You know, you're kind of cool and different <laughs> and enjoy wordplay and you're not some sort of slight caricature of a poet. But, you know, normally in a normal year, you would have been in multiple schools doing events for the infinite and you would have got energy from that, wouldn't you? You know, like any writer, it's like going out in the sun and, you know, refilling. Um, but you've had to go off and write the sequel to this, again, in this weird sort of vacuum. And how, how, how has that been? Has that been a sort of, um, has that been more of a challenge than writing the first book? Um, no, is the answer to that. Um, I mean, mm. I, I, I was really, miss I was very, very upset to not go into schools. Um, yeah. I'm sure. I love. I mean, one of one of my my, my favourite visit to a school ever was actually visiting year, year four class. Um, so we're talking sort of like eight and nine year olds, yeah. and um, which surprised me because I've done my, almost exclusively secondary. But I happened to do my 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 son was then in year four, and it was at the local primary school, and I did two year four classes, and they were absolutely amazing. The energy mm. of, of 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 them it was just phenomenal. The yeah. I mean, the sophistication of some of the questions, they, they were like year seven and eight questions coming from year fours. Yeah. I found it really interesting. So, yeah, it, it was an eye-opener for me, actually. And it, it made, maybe that partly sowed the seeds, in a sense, to write for a younger age group. I'd never considered that previously. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm missing that. But in terms of, in a way, in terms of writing, you just, for me, I, I just have to, well, I think for all writers, you have to go into a zone and you have to sort of get rid of everything else and just go into go into your own world and that was the that the hard thing was getting into the world but once i was in it i mean i was i was totally in it and i was able to engage and write very very quickly um so i, I mean i write i try to write a chapter a, a day a day um, Good yeah day. so um wow. so we're talking about 2000 words uh, maybe a bit less maybe a bit more um but um, I mean, that's that's to be fair. When I'm limbered up, I mean, when I when I was first the first two or three chapters, I wasn't doing that. I was writing about a thousand words a day, and um, I'm a bit that's frustrated a with myself. But yeah. Um, but yeah, within about within a couple of weeks, first couple of weeks, by then I was able to, you know, fairly easily, you know, get to the end of 
get to the end of the chapter in a day. It would be raw. It'd be really raw, really yeah. quite rough. But um, bear in mind, though, I often would have ideas for dialogue beforehand. So sometimes I wasn't writing completely cold. You know, I'd have no. a sense of what was going to happen. Remember, I had my storyboard and on top of that, maybe I'd had a few notes as to what might happen in the chapter, you know, in a particular mm. encounter or, you know, a particular voice or particular things I wanted Elle to say or particular wordplay or joke. So so that helped a lot. But um, my idea is to, yeah, to get the story down as quickly as possible. And it's raw, you know, just get to the end and then go back and <laughs> try to try to right. improve it. And in, in this case, I was able to go back and just, you know, get to the end of, of draft two. And then I then I that it was the end yeah. of June. So I had to send it in and I asked for an extra week. But my editor was going on furlough and she said, no, you can't have any more time. Give it to me now. <laughs> so I did. Wow. So, so you're I mean, I, I'm a lot of the people we've spoken to writers we've spoken to in the last uh, before the break, you know, 350 words or 500 words is what they aim to write each day. And then anything above that was a bonus. It sounds to me, if I'm right, what you're saying is you you write like the whole novel in a month. Is that right? 24 chapters, one um, day? Yeah, I almost. mean, well, what, what happened, I try to write it in a month, but what really happens yeah. is that chapters one, two, three, and four are quite slow. So yeah. um, it, it probably takes me about two weeks to write the first four chapters. And then, yes, I write, yeah, the rest of them, yeah, in about in about a month. Yeah. I mean, really, because I, I have to. <laughs> I mean, yeah. with, with the first book, I I was um, I had a bit more time, I suppose. Well, kind of. Um, because, but it had to come out in 2020 because the book is, of course, I didn't say it is actually set in 2020. It's centred around, you know, the 29th of February, the whole, you know, yeah. leap day 2020. So it had to come out this year. So the pressure was on in that sense. But but yes, I, I write incredibly quickly. I find, I prefer that. I prefer that because um otherwise i'd just get too precious and bear in mind i'm when i write when i used to write poetry i would do that kind of painstaking editing thing where i'd you know write a stanza a day or something and painfully you know mm. ponder each word and it was incredibly slow i mean it was wonderful and i loved it but actually it wasn't very productive and then i spoke to poet roger robinson um and um and he said he said that he just writes the first draft of every poem and just writes a whole book and I was like, you're joking. Is that what you do? And he says, yeah, that's what I do. And then I go back and then I have a, more, I have a sense of the shape of the book. And then I go back and I start doing all that nitty gritty poetic stuff. And I said, wow. Yeah. And it actually, and that actually helped me with Telling Tales because Telling Tales was very slow in the beginning as well. And I had to, you know, find a different method to actually, you know, speed the work up. And it also mm. gives you more confidence, I think, because well, certainly with any book, you know, because if you've written quite a lot, even if it's bad, you think, but I've written, oh, I've written a quarter of the book now. Totally. This can work. It's so, like the nano, um, nano remo that a lot of people do, the National Novel Writing Month, where people kind of sign up and, you know, at the end of it, they've written a novel. Now it may be a bit rubbish and a bit raggedy around the edges, but, but they can say, oh, look, I've written a book, and then they rewrite it. And I think you're, it's about kind of demystifying the process, isn't it? It's just getting something down on paper. Yeah, um, I mean, yeah, I would say, you know, if you have, you know, if you have an idea, have have a core idea, good, strong, central character right. and um, and a structure. For me, the, the structure is everything. Without that, I couldn't have couldn't have written a novel. So having that structure was very, very helpful because it was just like a guide. You know, it just sort of kept me on track and it doesn't mean that you don't change things around. You can. I mean, I've done a lot of changing around, especially with the first book. I had to change the whole ending. I changed the last five chapters before I kind of submitted to the publishers, but just to get to the end, it's it's a very satisfying point. Um, you froze there for a tiny moment, I think just with me, but I wanted to ask about character and forgive me if you just touched on that more. Um, how do you build, I and mean, the character of Elle is, do you kind of hot seat her to use a kind of drama term or do you kind of interview her? Do you do a questionnaire? How do you, how do you build the character up before you uh, take her on the adventure? What do you do? Um, oh, oh, confession time here. Um, Please, we I like confessions. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't really do any of that. Um, she's. I mean, she is different to me, but there's a lot of me in L. <laughs> so okay. um, it was just letting letting my my obsessions and passions run riot, really. Um, so um, you know, with with her voice, I, the voice just came to me. Really, the voice was just mm. desperate. I mean, I would. 
before I even started writing, I had loads of loads and loads of dialogue. I had loads of Belle talking. I really knew exactly what she sounded like. I mean, maybe bear in mind, I mean, the actual idea, when I had the idea of Elle initially, I applied to do a PhD in creative writing and, um, and I wanted to sort of explore the autistic voice. So I did loads and loads and loads of research on um, autism. I'd already done loads anyway because my son's autistic and I'm, it's, you know, challenges aside, but it's actually fascinating mm. looking at how different minds work and realising just the, the strengths and the, the joys, actually, that people, yeah. that we're not all the same. So that was interesting in itself. So I, I it was just, I had the voice. I, I really, it was very loud, so I couldn't ignore it. So I just had to, it was like the book was desperate to come out after all that reading and research. I knew exactly what she'd sound like. I knew which words we were gonna, she was gonna leap off, um, excuse the pun. Um, hmm. So that's really where she came from. I think it helped the, the Nigerian background thing was important too because there were there were points where she'll say things like, "Oh, um, Le Tomps is like a witchcraft," you know, like Nigerians will say someone's a witchcraft rather than they are a witch. So um, little mannerisms and things like that were just there. They were just there, you know, deep somewhere in in my psyche. I think so. Um, maybe I was my alter ego or something, but I didn't. I really didn't find that part hard at all. Um, you've you touched on the fact when you were at Oxford, you had a you had a tutor who encouraged you to read um, some African writers, and you know you've talked about now. Now clearly, look, we are we are in a we are in an era where the publishing world and a lot of other worlds, but the publishing world is looking at representation as widely as possible and how and its failings as as an industry. And I just wondered. You know, clearly, with any change, you start by recognizing a need for change, and that, that's an important thing. But I just sort of wonder what what do you feel that what do you feel publishing can do better now to kind of accelerate that that change? Because I mean, clearly, the great thing about the infinite on uh, on a, on, a, on an additional level is that somebody who is of a Nigerian background can go into a bookshop and can see a character on the front of a book who looks a bit like them and they want to pick it up and read it rather than feeling that it's not necessarily inviting them in. So I'm just, you know, it's a big complicated subject, but you know, I'm just fascinated to know your take on it. Yeah. I mean, I, I know the, um, the black writers guild have, have, you know, written this, this you know, a, num a number of, um, things that publish, publishers and people can do. I mean, a lot of it is that, uh, I suppose I would say the in, the industry just, just needs to, um, just, it, it just needs to change its mindset, really. I mean, in a way, in yeah. some ways, the, you know, one of the good things to come out of the pandemic is it does show that, that certain things can change overnight. I mean, you know, a, a, a horrible example maybe, but, you know, when people are told to stay at home, most people just stayed at home. You know, just suddenly people's behaviour changed instantly because, yeah. of course, there's a threat. People are frightened. But actually, you know, if you look in, in terms of culture, you know, it's 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 an insidious thing. You know, that, that the way that racism has maybe worked within culture, it's not so much a, um, you know, a willful thing. It's just that people no. just do what they've always done and maybe don't see the problem. Um, and yes, I, mean, I think there are a lot of people out there in publishing who really are aware that, that there is a problem. Um I mean, I suppose we have to have in, immediate initiatives. It's like, right, let's let's go out there. Let's let's look at what we do. Let's change. You know, some things maybe mm. can be changed overnight. Other things will take a bit longer. But um, you know, things like recruit recruitment, for example. Yeah, you know, exactly. that's that's the one of the core things that has come up time and time again. And that's and that's a complex one because you know it's also. You know, it merge it intermerges also with issues of class and all sorts of things. You know, publishing doesn't pay particularly well, so um, you know how you know is it is it going to attract people? You know, from my my cultural background, people didn't want me to go into. Can I keep speaking? As you can keep going. Yes, don't worry. We've just yeah. lost time temporarily there, but go on. It's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. My yeah. my cultural background, people. You know, we're, we're, I was encouraged to be a lawyer or a doctor, really, because pub, the thought of you know publishing doesn't. There's not really much money in it. You know, how can you help your community? So there is, you know, that that is also there too. It's that sense of, 
yeah and, and to sort of i suppose to have a job maybe as an editor maybe in marketing publicity maybe you earn more money i i have no idea but i i suspect you know publishing doesn't generally pay very well so that's a sort of related issue yeah. that maybe needs to be addressed yeah absolutely it's, it's fascinating you're right it's about it's it's layers it's education it's going right back to the beginning isn't it in order to make those changes so um but quite rightly as you say um, that the instantaneous change <coughs> overnight with the pandemic really just show you that we can do it if we try. Um, so now, I think now's the time definitely to start, uh, well, long overdue to start moving things along. Um, Simon will pop back in in a second, but we've got some fantastic questions. Oh, he's here. Hang on. I have to go and find him. Sorry. Give me a second. I have to go and uh, there he is. What happens now? I don't know where he's going to pop into. Oh, hang on. There he is. Oh, well, there, there we go. go. Four of us now. Hi. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I could hear all of that. And oh, sorry. Uh, it's a little, funny. But don't worry, I was in a, obviously in a world of my own at that point. Um, yes, yeah, so um, what, where were we? Yeah, we were talking about big, big questions. And I thought your, um, your, question, your answer about recruitment, I think, is a really important one. And it's certainly... But, you know, the, the key thing ultimately is good stories should be able to come from anywhere in the community and there shouldn't be any barriers to uh, to those stories being heard. And I think, you know, if, if there's been any theme that's come out of this, of the last 45 minutes, which I have to say has been absolutely fascinating. And thank you for your generosity because, you know, it's difficult on a Friday, you get up and just, you know, sit down in front of a laptop, but you're giving us, uh, you're giving us so much here. So thank you but if, if a theme's come out it's it's you know it is about storytelling isn't it and you you talked about you couldn't wait to let l burst out of you onto the page and i think that that is the purest most wonderful experience as a writer isn't it it's giving giving a voice to something maybe someone who already exists or someone you've created but are there um what what do you feel about where you're going to go beyond l do you, do you feel like this has given you a, you want to write an adult novel or you want to go back to poetry? Sorry, can I just ask, is book two more L? Yes, 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 yes. The, 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 well, the leap cycle is, is quite ambitious. They're actually, it's a quartet. Um, yeah, there'd be four because it's, because it's a leap. The whole idea is it starts in 2020 and ends in 2024. Yeah. Yeah. And it's sort of also it's a rite of passage because it's charting L from from 12 to 16 or three leap to four leap, as you will. Um, so, um, yeah. So it's so a book two is set in 2021 and so on. So so the idea is I actually write, um, write book, finish book two, finish editing book two and then get on to book three and four. Um, and who knows? I mean, would I write an adult novel? I don't know. Um, maybe um, I certainly I certainly would like to write more kind of sci fi stuff. I do. I do love kind of speculative fiction. Um, yeah. I'm talking very, very low tech sci-fi. I'm not a scientist, but I, yeah. I'm, I'm fascinated with, um, one of the things I'm fascinated with is clones. Um, Cause it, it, I'd love to clone myself. Cause then I would um, write several more poetry books and novels <laughs> simultaneously. Wow. Okay. Um, what, a question that's just come in, which I think is a really good one. It says, do you continue to write poetry while you're writing the novel? Do you have, are you, are you cloning yourself? Is there a, is there a kind of patience in one corner writing poetry while you're writing fiction or are you kind of i'm 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 very all or nothing i can only focus on one genre at a time um and so yeah when, when i'm in when i'm in l's world and the, the the world of the novel it's it's too big for me to let any poetry in that's that's my one frustration is not you know managing some people sort of manage to multitask in that way but i'm a bit all or nothing but what i'm i'm certainly hoping um, especially this year, because there's been a lot of deep thoughts going on. I'm hoping that there'll be a, a, a sort of space before I start working on book three, where I'll actually be able to go into a poetry zone and um, and create some poems. Um, I'm pleased I've got I have got a poem that's being published this year in a children's anthology, interestingly, um, which feels nice because it's kind of it still feels the poetry's somehow getting out there and. Um, it's a poem called Mr. Umbo's Umbrellas, and it's um, it's it's a joyful spring poem. Um, so um, yeah, I, I hope to maybe write some. I, I hope to write some joyful poems. That's my wish. That sounds fascinating. It's, yeah, it, think... it's really interesting because the, the creative space you only have so much creative space in your head, don't you? But um, and I think that's that's you know these books are obviously taking up a lot. Particularly, there's four of them, so you're holding four, effectively holding four stories in the story development. 
um, before you finish sort of executing the whole thing. It's really interesting. Can I just, I'm just going to say, there's one of the questions was what, what screenwriting books did you use? Um, are you allowed to reveal which ones, um, the ones you, you opted for? Um, yeah, it's one of the things, oh goodness, what were they called? Well, okay, one was called Save the Cat, which Save is a cat. very I knew this. That's great. <laughs> you know, it, it's infamous. Yeah, um, I mean, it, it sounds like the man screaming at you, you know, in a sort of Hollywood style, but it's very entertaining. Yeah. And very helpful, you know. It's a very yeah. That was that was particularly helpful. But I loved Into the Woods, which was more talking talking about story than the yeah, structure of story. So yeah. a much more sort of intellectual book. But um, but I mean, fantastic, um, fantastic route. Yeah, John um, to, to the different yeah. levels of story toy, how story works. Yeah, those are the two yeah. I can remember. There were three. Oh, the third one was about the psychology of story. I can't remember the name. Uh, it's fascinating. It's always interesting to hear the to hear what's inspired you. Um, definitely, that's fascinating. So that's great, and we'll we'll put links in for people as well. So if they want to pick those books up as well, um, Simon, can you see any more questions there that have popped up? Uh, yeah, somebody's interested in because it's a quartet of books. Do, have you had to do a kind of mini storyboard in your mind of books three and four because of how they might affect what you write in books one and two? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's um, yeah. There, there, there is a sort of a macro store. I actually have a separate board for all of them um, with a line for one, two, and three and four. So if I sort of come up with, I mean, I've got some like key plot points in three and four already there. But um, mm. yeah, yeah. But there's, but there's still a lot of room for uh, the creativity, she says, because certainly with book two, I had no idea how many new characters. There are quite a lot of characters in book two. Um, it's a lot of fun, but um, but yeah, some of them even surprised me. So even though I did have a sort of general story arc, there was mu much more happened once I started r sort of rigorously storyboarding. It doesn't sound like you have time for writer's block. I mean, if somebody was interested in what do you do if you have a day when you just can't write, but it sounds to me like there's no time to have writer's block with you, is there? No, I mean, I know Bernadine Everisto always used to say there's no such thing as writer's block, that you simply should you know, when you're not in that mode, you're reading, you're researching. So you're always in some sense feeding the writing. So there's a continuum. Yeah. And I like yeah. that idea because I think once you sort of, I mean, I, I, I'm, and I'm speaking as somebody who has had terrible blocks between books and proper okay. depression between books. So, you know, I'm not saying that lightly, but um, for me, interesting, having to write book two was a very good thing. I mean, I was cursing the fact that I'd <laughs> crazily taken on four books. Well, certainly the first two anyway. Yeah. Um, in terms of my deal, I, I, I was I was very um, annoyed, but but it actually just fought, just made me do it again. It was having a structure, it was in terms of like a time structure, where actually by the end of June I had to send something else in. And obviously, if I'd been much more unwell, that that couldn't have happened. Thankfully, I wasn't badly unwell. You know, I had a month off, but I was able to, yeah. you know, produce. And it was a good thing for me. It was a good thing. I had to step up. And just get on with it. And I, I am good with deadlines, though. I'm generally very good with deadlines. I like them. I like having that external structure to sort of spur me on. That's great. It's, it's absolutely fascinating listening to your progress, your process, and your enthusiasm and um, just love of the words and the books is coming through so clearly to everybody. It's it's just wonderful. It's so inspiring. Um, it's I think I I love the detail that you put into the internet and the way your mind works in terms of patterns and um, yeah, the, the words and the numbers and everything, you can see them all intertwining. And I think that, as you say, structure is just so important and it's something that's going to carry you through so well. Um, we've gotten loads of comments here about people loving the storyboarding idea. Um, they'll all be running out to buy storyboards now. <laughs> and your yellow stars with plot points is really good, actually, because that really yeah. makes you, visually, you can see the pattern then, can't you, of the way the plot is developing across the different stories. Um, so it's absolutely fascinating. Really, really, really great. Um, so the infinite is um, out now and uh, we have um, the links in the chat that have come through in the comments there um, and we also have links to say the cat and to John Woods and uh, John York's into the woods um, so people can find those um, Simon have you anything to, to we're just getting to the, to the very end you, you, anything to wrap up with um, just to you know that the hour has absolutely whizzed by and oh. I think it's it's been really inspirational and I think it's sort of you know, I, I certainly I, I love hearing about process and I love hearing about inspiration. But I think what comes across from you is 
you like to have fun with words and you like to have fun with storytelling. And I think, you know, particularly after this year, we all need more fun in our lives. So thank you for um, ending the week with some fun. Uh, it's, been, it's been really, really brilliant. So um, thank you very much. It's been, it's been fantastic. Great. Thank you so much. I think the, this is a book that for adults to read as well, for adults who are oh, totally. in story and structure and everything. It's just definitely, definitely really good. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much for inviting me because you know not having the live gigs has been challenging. So it's lovely to just have other other writers and believers and you know enablers like Simon to 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 help me talk about these issues. You know, it's been Brilliant. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. And it was, it, this will be staying around, won't it? So anyone can listen to it at any point. In the oh, future, absolutely. This is recorded. We're actually, we've been broadcasting simultaneously to YouTube and to Facebook um, for this session. And um, and we will do for the rest of September. So now I've worked out how the technology works. Um, and yeah, so people can, can watch back at any time. And um, we'll be sharing it across all our various social media platforms as well. Um, and this is actually you kicking off our first part of this new season. Um, so we've got some more writers to come. And I'll be talking to Sophie Hanna next week um, about crime and her process um, and learning more from her and um, then we have got Stephen Hall coming and then um, Simon's going to be talking to Stephen Hall and then I'll be talking to Amit Dand, AA Dand. So we've got a great schedule. Thank you so much Patience uh, yeah, for kicking us off brilliant. and getting us off to such a brilliant start. Uh, we'll go through the questions afterwards and if there's anything that um, has popped up that we need to ask you we might we'll drop you an email. I'm sure Simon will be in touch too. So thank you very very much indeed for joining us in the writing game. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.